for a blessing on the sermon. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Let us not love in word nor in tongue, but in deed and in truth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. My dear faithful, I would like to thank you first of all for having been faithful to the, the mission sermons this week. And as we close our mission today, we have yet one more thing to speak about, something that's very important, that of resolutions. The first half of our mission, like on a retreat, was consecrated to looking at ourselves, realizing some of the great eternal truths, and cleansing our heart of those false loves that are in there. This second half of our mission, however, is looking towards the future. We've considered the means of perseverance, prayer and devotion to Our Lady, confidence in God's mercy. Now we consider the last of these means of perseverance, resolutions. Because what happens if you've come here all this week on mission, and yet you leave the chapel today, unresolved to serve God any better than when you first came on mission in the beginning of the week. You know who's going to be waiting right out there at the door of the church for you, the devil himself. If the devil sees someone who, hasn't been <clears throat> who has not prepared any resolutions by with, with which to fight the devil and fight those concupiscences, the devil realizes he's got an easy meal here. The importance, therefore, of being prepared. Now, you will notice that by the door of the church, back where the brown scapulars were, there are sheets made up for you, which you may take home with you, entitled Mission Resolutions. And we'll be speaking about this and explaining it. For missions, we usually suggest taking home two resolutions with you. One, concerning prayer, and one, fighting your predominant fault. Prayer is going to be important, obviously, because as we saw yesterday, it's the breath of our spiritual life. The first thing that we suggest is making sure that you say your daily rosary. <clears throat> the rosary is not merely vocal prayer, but mental prayer with the words added on to it. Therefore, with the rosary, all the good things of prayer are combined. Mental prayer, vocal prayer, devotion to our Lord, devotion to Our Lady. This most important devotional practice also has many graces attached to it. Now, if you're already saying your daily rosary, then what you want to consider as a resolution is adding on morning and evening prayers. It doesn't have to be long prayers, even if you simply say your three Hail Marys in the morning, three Hail Marys before you go to bed, at least that's something, and that certainly is a good practice. Now, what if you're already saying not only your daily rosary, but also your morning and evening prayers? Then the next step is to make a good resolution to make a daily meditation. It doesn't have to be long. 10 or 15 minutes even is a good practice. There are many good books out there written for lay people. Divine Intimacy by the Carmelite Friar and then many of the devotional works of St. Alphonsus de Liguori. There are others also, even just a life of the saint. You can read a little bit, think a little bit, pray a little bit. That's what mental prayer is. It's not hard. Finally, if you're also in the habit of making a daily meditation, then what you want to add on is a little bit of spiritual reading each day. Once again, it doesn't have to be much. If you're a busy person, five minutes, either in the morning or in the evening, even from the imitation of Christ, is another excellent practice. For those who have a little bit more time, Certainly, 15 minutes, perhaps even half an hour, another good practice. 
but certainly to read the lives of the saints, which, as St. Alphonsus said, are the gospel reduced to practice. We get many ideas from the lives of the saints on how to battle our predominant faults, how to practice the Christian virtues. <clears throat> the other resolution that we need to take, however, is regarding what we call our predominant fault. And this is what I would like to speak about most this morning. I would like to tell you a little story to, to examine what kind of person we are. The story is about little Billy and his Tonka truck. There's a little boy named Billy, and he's maybe about seven years old, and he's got a beaten old Tonka truck. You remember what Tonka trucks are like. And Billy's been having fun with his Tonka truck all over the house, all over Mommy's garden in the back. It's beat up, it's scratched up. It doesn't look all that good. It's all the worse for wear. But it's Billy's favorite toy. He's attached to it. He loves it above everything else. And you can imagine him one day, he's probably out there in, in the garden or maybe inside the house playing with his Tonka truck, vroom, vroom, erk. And when Mommy suddenly comes up to him and says, Billy, your little brother Johnny really likes your Tonka truck. And if you were a good boy, you'd give it to him, wouldn't you? Poor Billy. What's Billy going to do? He loves his Tonka truck. Well, there's three ways that Billy could react. The first way, which is perhaps most typical of little boys, is that Billy is going to suddenly hide it behind his back and say, Tonka truck? Mommy, what Tonka truck? I don't have a Tonka truck. You must be thinking of the boy down the street. So in the first case, Billy is going to lie because he loves his Tonka truck so much, he doesn't care whether he gets in trouble with mommy or not. He loves his Tonka truck more than he loves mommy, more than he loves his little brother Johnny. Now there's a second way that little Billy could react. Little Billy could say, well, you know, this Tonka truck means an awful lot to me, but you know what? My little brother Johnny's got something I like even better than my Tonka truck. He's got a matchbox car collection. Okay, mommy, he says, sure, I'll give little Johnny my Tonka truck, as long as I get his matchbox car collection in return. <laughs> <coughs> and we see here, of course, in the second case, little Billy is making a bargain with mommy. It's not so much that he loves mommy, he still loves his Tonka truck, but he's looking for what he can get out of the deal. There's finally a third way that little Billy could react, one that is perhaps rather idealistic for a little child, but which nevertheless could possibly happen. Mommy could, could pop the question to little Billy, and little Billy looks down at his Tonka truck and says, Tonka, we've had so much fun together. I've known you all my life. And we've gone all over this house and all over Mommy's garden and all through the mud, and I really love you an awful lot. And then he looks up at Mommy, a little tear comes down his eye, and he says, but I love Mommy more than I love you. And so he gives his Tonka truck to Mommy to give to his little brother Johnny. These are three ways in which little Billy could react. And these are three ways in which we react also when God asks a sacrifice from us. In the case of little Billy, he's got what we call a particular attachment, his Tonka truck. And that particular attachment is going to get him in trouble with mommy unless he actually makes the sacrifice of it. Little Billy also has what we call a predominant fault. It's his selfishness. And that selfishness is also going to get him into trouble with mommy unless he actually gives it up. Each one of us also, you and me, have a predominant fault and a particular attachment. With regards to our particular attachments, unfortunately, ours are not so easy as little Billy's. If only it were a case of 
giving up our red Porsche or giving up our BMW motorcycle, it would be really easy. But no, actually for us, our predominant, our, our particular attachments lie within our heart. And the danger is that we tend to make this particular attachment of ours an idol on the, on the altar of our heart. You can think of your heart as being a, 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 as a, as a tabernacle there. There's an altar there, that the, your heart is an altar which should be dedicated to Jesus Christ. A tabernacle there in your heart where he lives. Unfortunately, oftentimes we tend to put this false god, this idol of our, our particular attachment on top of that altar, on top of that tabernacle, and we're willing to bow down to it and begin worshiping it, this false god, in the place of Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> there are three particular attachments which are extremely common. I don't say that these are exhaustive, but indeed that these are the most common ones. Love of ease, self-esteem, and self-will. And these are not found outside of us, but they are right here in the middle of our heart, vying with Jesus Christ for first place in our heart. And oftentimes, like little Billy, we begin to serve that particular attachment we fall down to that false god, that idol in our heart, and say, oh, love of ease, oh, self-esteem, oh, self-will, I worship you, and you alone could make me happy. I am willing to sacrifice everything, even God's grace, even Jesus Christ's presence in my soul, as long as I can keep you. <clears throat> you see, we tend to think that this false god, this idol in our heart, can actually make us happy. But really, consider it. Whether your, your particular attachment is love of ease, or self-esteem, or self-will, can it really make you happy? No. Only God can give you true happiness. And therefore, the importance of overthrowing, of toppling over this false god, this idol that's in our heart, so that Jesus Christ can be sole king of our hearts. Now, while we have this particular attachment here in our heart, it does externalize itself in other ways by what we call our predominant fault. Everyone has a predominant fault. Usually we even have more than one, but at a given point in our life, there's usually one in particular that stands out among the rest. Sometimes it can change or mutate during life, that's true. The, more, the harder that we work against one particular fault, it might change to another one over the course of years through our own effort. Obviously assisted with God's grace. Now, our predominant fault is not going to be something mortally sinful. Rather, it's going to be something, it might be venial by its nature, it might be something not even venial by its nature, but it is the root by which we commit all the other sins or the majority of, our, of the sins of our lives. Now, many people would simply be inclined to think, oh, I know what my particular attachment is, uh, sorry, what my predominant fault is, it's, it's lust. No, it's not, because there is a deeper root to that. To the, to the vice opposed to the holy virtue, there are two very common roots which we need to look at instead. One is going to be laziness. The other is going to be curiosity of the eyes. These are very common, but these are the roots and it brings forth the, 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 the bad weeds of the, of, the vir, of the vice opposed to the holy virtue. Now, let's take a look at some of the predominant faults and how they're attached to the particular attachments. And let's see also what kind of resolutions we can possibly take in order to overcome these predominant faults. 
If you realize that you have a particular attachment of love of ease, always seeking to, 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 to satisfy yourself in certain ways, it can come from laziness. In other words, that you don't like to work, you don't like to keep busy. In which case, the suggested mortification, the suggested resolution for this is going to be mortification. In other words, keeping busy. If you're lazy, keep busy, and many of the sins of your life will simply disappear. Now, love of ease can also beget curiosity, a bad curiosity, especially curiosity of the eyes, having to see everything, notice everything, judge everything with the eyes. And this is dangerous, and it leads to a lot of sins, of course. If you realize that this is your predominant fault, the only way you're going to overcome it is what we call the custody of the eyes. It's true that we can't go through life, unfortunately, with blinders on like this, but there is a radical difference between simply taking a first notice of something and actually steadfastly gazing at something that we shouldn't be looking at. That is what we must avoid. Now, <clears throat> perhaps you have a particular attachment of self-esteem, a very common one indeed. Self-esteem can show itself exteriorly in different ways. One is by gossiping. That may seem a little bit strange, because how does that help our self-esteem? It actually does, because when we gossip about other people and say how bad they are, etc., it's actually implicitly saying, I'm so much better than they are. So that our self-esteem is built up by the gossip. In this case, there is only one way of dealing with gossip. Mortification of the tongue. To bite our tongue before we speak. To think before saying something about our neighbor. It's a hard one, yes it is, but it's worthwhile. And if we fulfill this resolution and are faithful to it, certainly we will receive many graces from God. Self-esteem can also manifest itself through human respect. Oh my goodness, I hope everyone thinks really well of me. Because of course, we want to think well of ourselves. Now in this case, the best resolution is to strive to please God rather than pleasing man. So in other words, it's really living our, our morning offering. When we say in the morning that we're going to do everything in our day and offer it up to Jesus Christ through Our Lady, then we've got to remember that during the day, that we're not just doing it just to please the people around us, whether our family or our, our co-workers, etc., we're doing it to please God. What God thinks of us is what's important, not what other people think of us. Self-esteem can also be manifested as ambition. I've got to be the top dog on top of the mountain because of course, I'm so much better than anyone else. I'm the greatest, I'm the best. Ew, that pride is this form of self-esteem. With regards to this ambition, oftentimes there's an underlying current of envy and of jealousy. I don't want anyone else to be as good as I am. Now the only way to overcome this is going to be through fraternal charity, to rejoice in the good that others have. And the only way we can really do that is by seeing Christ in our neighbor. Are we jealous of our Lord? No, he's God. He has a right to be all things, to possess all things. Therefore, if we see Christ in our neighbor, we will not be jealous of him, nor will we be ambitious for ourselves. Self-esteem can yet again be seen in the form of discouragement. This might seem a little bit strange. You think someone who's discouraged is usually because they don't have self-esteem. 
No, not really, actually. Discouragement actually shows that there's this hidden self-esteem that says, I ought to be better than I am. So it's a little bit different form, but it's still self-esteem. Melancholics, in particular, tend to this predominant fault. And the only resolution that's really going to be able to kick this habit is going to be confidence in God. In other words, realizing that, yes, of course, we have to cooperate with God's grace, but it's Jesus who is our perfection, not we ourselves. Now, the third particular attachment that is most common is going to be self-will. This can show itself up as anger. I'm not getting my way, therefore I'm going to let everyone know about it. And we have to take a resolution in this case with regards to patience. Look, as long as God is not being offended, let others have their way to be able to sacrifice myself instead of insisting on my way all the time. Again, some people might not be exactly angry, but they do insist on my way or the highway. And this is because they lack the spirit of self-sacrifice. It's got to be the way I want things rather than the way anyone else wants it. Here, self-sacrifice must be put into practice in order to overcome that. Let others do things their way as long as it's not offensive to God. To sacrifice ourselves, it's hard, but it's a good thing to do. Now, you'll notice that on the sheet here, which you can take home with you, at the bottom it says, my mission resolutions are regarding prayer, a blank space, regarding my predominant fault, blank space. So take that home, fill it in so that you know what kind of resolutions you need to take home with you today from the mission. And that way, and what, because what I usually suggest is for people to write down their resolutions and even just on a small slip of paper, keep it by your bedside so that you can see it when you get up in the morning to remind yourself of what you need to fight during the day. And then also, as you can see it at nighttime, to ask yourself, how faithful have I been to my resolutions? And this is a good way of making spiritual progress in a short time. Let's go back to that story of Little Billy then. We saw Little Billy in three different versions. And this refers to what St. Ignatius of Loyola refers to as the three classes of men. The first Billy, what did he do? He procrastinated. He loved his Tonka truck more than he loved mommy, more than he loved his little brother Billy. And of course, as a result, he was going to get in trouble with mommy. That's what the procrastinator in the spiritual realm does also. Oh, do I have to say my rosary? Fifteen minutes, I'm dying. Or it might be a case of confession. Oh, I'm sure it wasn't a mortal sin. Oh, I just went to a confession a month or two ago. I'll wait another month now. Or it might be with regards to avoiding occasions of sin. I know that I'm strong enough that I can avoid this occasion of sin. Let's say the internet, you know, I'm not going to fall into sin this time. Wink, wink. So there's a lot of dangers there. The procrastinator knows that he must love God and he knows that he must work out the salvation of his soul. But he says, sure, I'd love God. I'd save my soul if only it weren't so hard. In other words, the procrastinator isn't willing to make any sacrifices, even for his own salvation. <coughs> There's a real danger to being a procrastinator. For the procrastinator, salvation is extremely doubtful because tepidity which is what procrastination is in the spiritual life. Tepidity leads to mortal sin. Mortal sin takes us to hell. Therefore, the absolute importance that if I'm a procrastinator, I've got to get out of that state now. 
The second class of men are the bargainers. Remember little Billy. He's willing in this case to give up his Tonka truck as long as he gets something back from his little brother. Personally, I believe that most traditional Catholics fall in this second class of persons. The bargainer is attached and yet in a certain sense wants to be detached and yet attached at the same time. The bargainer wants to serve both God and the world. Sometimes it's in ways that aren't even so obvious. Sometimes a bargainer can, can say, well, <coughs> I'm serving God, and you know, I, you know I'm, I'm doing all my prayers, and I make sure that everyone sees that I'm doing my prayers, and, I'm, and, everyone, and everyone notices how pious I am, and yet at the same time, even in the certain sense, they are serving the world because of human respect. What do other people think of me? As a result, this bargaining with God, in other words, sort of making this change off, okay, God, tell you what, I'll give, you, I'll give you my time in prayer, I'll give you my time in good works, I'll give you all sorts of things, uh, I'll do all things, sorts of things for you, for, for you, God, but God, don't you dare touch my, my predominant fault, my particular attachment. I've got to keep this idol in my heart. Don't dare touch it. Making bargains with God. <clears throat> this is dangerous. Now it's true that the procrast sorry that the bargainer is better off than the procrastinator because with the bargainer there is at least a real incipient beginning love of God but there's a lot of self love mixed in with it too that's where the danger lies now the soul that is content with being a bargainer what happens to it it goes on and on. Oftentimes, it'll lose, lose faith in God if it's not moving forward. The soul, that, the bargainer who's not moving forward to, towards a greater love of God is going to be falling backwards. And oftentimes what happens is this. The bargainer will be praying to God, asking for something, asking, 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 and God doesn't answer the prayer. And then the bargainer says, well, okay, God, if you're not going to answer my prayer, I'm not going to pray to you anymore. And that's dangerous because then the bargainer falls back into being a procrastinator. That's the danger. However, there are bargainers who realize that they're bargainers and they want to love God more. These bargainers are actually on the road to being the third class but they've got really to want to belong to that third class of person. They've got to actively work for it also. Because what happens is if they remain bargainers, what happens if they die as bargainers? Okay, they'll save their souls, but they're going to end up in purgatory for a long, long time. And no one wants that. The third class of person, however, is like that third Billy. Billy realizes, yes, he's been attached to his Tonka truck, but he also realizes that he loves mommy more than he loves his Tonka truck. Same thing for the, this third class of persons, what we may call the lovers of God. <clears throat> for such souls as these, the creature is only a means to the creator. God's good pleasure, God's will is the only rule of their life. Therefore, they will use creatures in order to serve God, but they will also give up creatures if it's going to serve God better. And so a good way to find out whether you are a truly a lover of God is to ask yourself a few questions here. Firstly, ask yourself, do I try to avoid not only all mortal sin, but even all deliberate venial sin? all deliberate faults. Again, you can ask yourself, do I want God to strip me of my pre predominant fault of my particular attachment? And finally, which is the touchstone of love, ask yourself, am I willing to suffer and to be despised for Jesus Christ, 
who is willing to suffer and to be despised for love of me. For such as have received this grace of being true lovers of God, because indeed it's not something that this person has done, rather it's a gift from God. For such as these, there are no dangers. There are only advantages to loving God. One advantage is that salvation becomes morally certain. We can never be absolutely certain of our salvation, but we, in, in the case of those that truly love God, there is what we call a moral certainty given certain signs. Further, these souls that truly love God, they follow in the steps of Jesus Christ. They want to suffer. They want to be despised. They want to go with Jesus each step of the road to Calvary. As a result, because of their fervor in imitating his life, in loving Jesus Christ, God gives these souls greater graces. Yes, greater crosses, but at the same time, greater graces to carry those crosses. Now, let's take a look again at the procrastinators. Procrastinators we can compare to spiritual adulterers, because that's what it is. To be a procrastinator, to say that, you know, I'll serve, I'll, you know, I, I, I would serve, serve God, but it's just too hard, it's spiritual adultery. Because what happens is that our hearts should belong entirely to God. And the procrastinator is saying, I give my love to this self, self-will, self-esteem, love of ease. That's spiritual adultery. So the absolute importance of overcoming that procrastination. Now, a bargainer is going to be in a case of, let's say, it's like an unhappy marriage. Unhappy marriage where one spouse is doing all the giving and the other spouse is doing all the taking. Same thing here with the bargainer. The bargainer is giving very little to God and is trying to get as much from God as possible. Those that truly love God, it's like in a perfect marriage. There's this constant give and take between both spouses. Same thing in this case with those that truly love God. That soul has given everything to its God. It's body with its senses, its soul with its faculties. God can do with that, that soul and that body whatever God likes. And as a result, because that, that person has given himself entirely to God, what does God give to that soul? Himself. Not just what he has, but what he is, who he is. The soul then, because of that gift of itself, receives all that the divinity is and all, this, all the perfections and all the holy virtues of the sacred humanity of Jesus Christ. That is indeed true love, where God stoops down to accept the love of a sinful creature. <clears throat> Ask yourself then, what class of person do you belong to? If you're a procrastinator, you've got to do something about it now. It's no use procrastinating any longer. Don't even leave the church today without taking some good resolutions to move forward spiritually. Because if you're a procrastinator, you may not be able to save yourself. Now, if you're a bargainer, then what you must do is make sure that you're not moving backwards and losing faith and confidence in God, but that you're moving forward towards that third class of person so that you love God and are more willing to serve him under any circumstance, any kind of suffering. And for those who have, who have been given this grace of the, to be a th one of the, in the third class of person, here, remember, it's a gift from God. Humble thanks are what must be rendered 
and also to ask constantly for generosity in continued that that continued self-sacrifice to God and also fidelity to love God alone and God in all things. Let us then go to Our Lady, she who loved God perfectly, and she is the wonderful image of her maker. She wants to be able to, to fill us with that divine fire of the sacred love of God in order that that fire of the divine love will be able to, to cast out of ourselves all selfishness, all that love of ease, all that ego, that self-will, that self-esteem. But we've got to let Jesus and Mary act there. Let us ask them for this grace during our Mass today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.